Okay. All right, and uh, now we're almost done. We figured out what the direction of the induced current is. I'm sorry, we figured out the magnitude of the current. However, you're likely to be asked for directions as well. And that's a whole other thing using Lenz's law. So we need to review how to do that. All right, that's a little complicated, so I tried to set that out in the flow chart as well. Um, over here, the direction of the induced current is found from Lenz's law, so I tried to break that down into three steps. So this is uh, Lenz's law. So this is what I put here in the flowchart. So um, step one is the magnetic flux increasing or decreasing here? Increase. Because the magnetic field is increasing. An increase in B should increase the flux. So I'm going to write that down. The magnetic flux is increasing. Uh, now we want to go on to step two. The induced field is supposed to oppose the flux. What direction should this be in to oppose this? Should the magnetic field be pointing out of the page or into the page? Which of those would oppose this change? Yeah. What we have here is we're getting more and more flux out of the page, so to speak. More and more flux out of the page. Well, the way to overcome that is to have uh, uh, an induced field that's into the page. So that's Lenz's law. Lenz's law says that the direction of the induced field opposes this change. All right, and then if you know the direction of the induced field, you should be able to figure out the direction of the induced current using the right hand rule. Although we might have some trouble with this because you and I have really only worked with the right hand rule for long straight wires. We never worked with the right hand rule for loops. Um, so I'm not sure whether it's clear how to use the right-hand rule in this case. So the key thing is that we should just focus our attention on um, one part of the wire. So for example, let's focus our attention on this part of the wire. Um, and now where is the induced field going to be? Well, the induced field is going to be here on the inside of the loop because this is where it could oppose the change in the flux. So we want to know what the induced field will be here caused by this wire. So let's see if we can now use um, the right hand rule for um, magnetic fields to work that out. If you need to, you can uh, refresh your memory of that in the handout. How would that work here? Um, well, so I think you want the field to be facing into the board. Right. Um, and the fingers are pointed this way because that's where it is. Right. And so the current is down. That's good. That's good. So we talked about how when we use this right hand rule, you have to put your thumb in the location of the current and your fingers in the location of the field. Well, in this case, the current is over here and the field is over here, so I need to put my fingers to the left of my thumb. Um, so that can look like this. But which way do I want the induced current to be? I, maybe I should have written that down. I want the induced current to be into the board, so I make my finger pads point into the board, just like you did, and my thumb is pointing down. By the way, notice this would also have worked fine if you picked any other point on the wire. For example, what would have happened if you picked this point on the wire? Let's try that for practice. What would the right hand rule tell us then? Okay. Your finger pads pointing facing to the board, right? And I'm pointing down because that's the point I'm looking at. And so I think that the current is going to the right. That seems right. So we need to put our, uh, now the, the wire is above the field. So we need to put our thumb above our fingers. Our thumb above our fingers, which could look like this or like this. Well, which way should it look? Well, we want our finger pads to be pointing, pointing into the board. Am I getting this right? Yeah, like this. So now my thumb represents this point on the wire, and my finger pads are pointing into the board like the magnetic field, and my thumb is pointing to the right. We could have already figured that out from this down here. In order to be consistent with this direction, this direction has to be to the right, because we've already seen that we're flowing clockwise, but we can do this for a check. 
All right, so that's something we didn't get a chance to talk about before that you're likely to see on the test. We only showed how to use this right hand rule for long straight wires. Now we're seeing how to use it for loops, which you're likely to see. This would also work for a circular loop. Again, you have to pick one particular point that your thumb is going to represent on the loop, and then you have to put your fingers in the right position relative to that um, to, uh, to figure out what the direction is. Good. All right, so what did we work out here? What is going to be the direction of our induced current? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Clockwise. Clockwise. It doesn't really much, do much good to say that the direction is down, because the direction would be up over here. It's better to say clockwise or counterclockwise. All right, so what was the answer to the question? What's the magnitude and direction of the induced current? Well, the current has a magnitude of 4.8 amps and it's flowing in a clockwise direction. Um, the mathematical concept of current is a scalar, so it doesn't have a direction, but we can still talk about what direction the actual charges, the actual current is flowing in, so this current would be flowing clockwise. All right, so this is how we use Lenz's law. So it's important to have this in your notes, because again, this is something that tends to give people a lot of trouble. So notice the steps here. First, you figure out whether the flux is increasing or decreasing. And then you focus on what direction the magnetic field should be in. So no, uh, notice that we don't try to figure out whether this induced flux should be increasing or decreasing. We just try to figure out its direction. Uh, and then you can use a right hand rule to go from that uh, to the current. OK, uh, very good. Something they didn't ask you here, but uh, I saw one question in the sample exams. They might also ask you um, whether our, um, our voltage here is uh, going to be positive or negative. And again, we said we're, gonna try, we're not going to try to learn how to use this negative sign here. Your course isn't really focusing on that. They don't even talk about this in your textbook. Um, instead, um, you can figure it out from the current. So let's say that this current is flowing in the positive direction. Well, then the EMF would be considered positive. Or let's say that this current is flowing in the negative direction. Well, then the EMF would be negative. And in your course, they would just tell you what the positive direction is or the negative direction for the current. So if they do ask you for the sign for this, we're not going to use this negative sign. In fact, maybe I'll just take that out now. So we're just going to focus on magnitudes here. And if they ask you for the sign, you just focus on which way the current is moving. If the current is moving in what they told you is the positive direction, then the EMF would be positive. And if the current is moving in what they told you is the negative direction, then the EMF would be negative. And that's here in the flow chart uh, as well. Uh, if the current is in the positive direction, then the induced voltage is positive. And if the current's in the negative direction, then the induced voltage is uh, negative. So I put that here in the flow chart as well. OK, so let's review um, the key uh, steps here. So these are the steps again beneath the flow chart. First, you have to get an expression, not a number, for the flux, because only an expression can you take the derivative of. And to take the derivative, you'll either need the derivative of b or a or the cosine of theta. In this particular case, it was straightforward because they simply told us what the derivative of b was. But most problems will be more difficult. Remember, we shouldn't waste any time trying to get a number for b. All we need is a number for the derivative of b. OK, does that make any sense? OK, well, that's the very simplest possible Faraday's problem. So. Try something a little harder. 